Greetings and God bless you in the wonderful name of our living Lord and Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. Once again, it's time to get into the greatness of God's word. I'm Robert Hagan right here on Uptime uh, Church. And uh, what I'd like to do today is like to look at the uh, word of God and the title uh, or subject will be uh, Against All Odds, Faith Versus Fear. And um, I was thinking the other day about <clears throat> what I was going to talk about. And uh, as I was telling Greg a few minutes ago, I really wasn't getting anything. It was like I came up against, a, you know, you, you drive down at the end of the cul-de-sac and you have to turn around and go back out to the main road. And uh, finally, yesterday, I started thinking about this. And uh, I believe the Lord wanted me to talk about this because of the way things are going these days. There's a lot of fear. Um, people are scared. The coronavirus, coronavirus 19. Um, it seems like uh, on top of people being afraid of getting the coronavirus, it's um, there's just been an incredible amount of fear in the country. People, a lot of people's businesses have have closed up because of this, and people have just their attitudes are changing, and it's you know, it's something we need to we need to look to the Lord. We need to uh, lean on Him in these times. And what we're going to do first, we're going to go to the Second Timothy. And the verse, the first verse, excuse me, the first chapter of Second Timothy in verse seven says, for God hath not given us the spirit of fear or cowardice is what the word fear means, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. OK, power in that verse is dunamis, that's inherent power, love is agapeo, or the love of God, and a sound mind is uh, soundness, a sound mind, a sane mind, a, uh, a mind that, um, like I've said before many times, to have a sound mind, you have to have it, the uh, word of God living and real within you, and by putting on the word of God, your mind becomes more clear, and uh, it just functions better. You know, God designed the mind for, for the word of God. He designed us, uh, man and, you know, men and womankind to uh, be in fellowship with him and also to have our minds that we're, where we can fellowship and function and, and uh, think clearly. And one of the uh, <clears throat> guys in the Old Testament, one of the guys in the Old Testament, one of the fellows in the Old Testament that really had quite a challenge in front of him uh, was a man by the name of Joshua. Now, of course, Joshua was Moses' right-hand man, but at the end of Moses' life, as we're going to get into Joshua, the first chapter, and we're going to read quite a bit of it, um, as soon as Moses passed away, the um, everything went on to Joshua. And I don't know, how would you like to have been Joshua? realizing that you were going to have to be the leader of this tremendous amount of people, these tremendous amount of people. And how would you do it? And of course, he's seen Moses' example, but he also needed the encouragement so that he could win against all odds. And, and believe me, there were a lot of things that were against him from the beginning. So what we're going to do is we're going to go to the first chapter of the book of Joshua. We're just going to read a little bit here. It's really interesting, too. Um, in verse 1, it says, Now after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Moses, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now in the ancient Hebrew, this is... Uh, this. These four words, Moses, my servant, is dead. Uh, it's interesting because it's very guttural. It's like, Moses, my servant, is dead with a lot of sorrow. It was like God said, you know, Moses, my servant, is dead. You know, Now, therefore, and he's speaking to Joshua, says, Arise, go over this Jordan, thou and all the people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Here we start with the promises. 
Verse 3, every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea, toward the going down of the sea, sun, shall be your coast. There shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life, as I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Okay, right there in the first five verses, you can see the encouragement, the edification, exhortation, and comfort that the Lord was giving to Joshua to lead this great multitude of people. And I'm not going to leave you, and I'm not going to fail you. I'm going to be with you every step of the way. This is what we have to think in today's day and time. Things may look really bad, and they do. But you know what? God is always faithful. He's not going to fail us. He's going to give us the courage that we need to carry on. And here in verse 6, Be strong and of a good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Verse 7, Only be strong and very courageous. See, he has a thing about courage, God. So he's telling them, you got to be very courageous that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses, my servant, commanded thee. And he says, turn not from it to the right hand or to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. In other words, focus. Don't get distracted by every wind of doctrine, as it says in the New Testament. The cunning craftiness of men where they lie and wait to deceive. Well, they do. Hey, come on over here. This is the way you should check this out. You just... This Christianity stuff, you know, that's 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 a crutch. That's for people that can't, that don't have enough strength to do it on their own. The Lord says to him, "Don't you don't turn to don't turn away from it. You focus. You go right with me, and I'm going to take you through this life, and you're going to win." This book of the law in verse eight shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. And then in verse 9 again, he says it to him again. Have I not commanded thee, be strong and of a good courage? Be not afraid, neither be thou dismayed. For the Lord thy God is with thee, whithersoever thou goest. Okay. That's a tremendous section. And as you get into verses 10 through the rest of the chapter, uh, he gives instructions. Uh, Joshua commands the people, so he gets things together here. And um, I'll tell you what we're going to do. We're going to go ahead and read it instead of me trying to do a summary of it. Verse 10, And Joshua commanded the officers of the people, saying, Pass through the host and command the people, saying, Prepare you victuals, for within three days ye shall pass over this Jordan to go into the land, to possess the land which the Lord your God giveth you to possess it. And to the Reubenites and to the Gadites and to half the tribe of Manasseh spake Joshua, saying, Remember the word which Moses, the servant of the Lord, commanded you, saying, The Lord your God hath given you rest and hath given you this land. You see, it's so fantastic, these promises. He says, be, be thou strong and of a good courage. Be, be very courageous. And then he says to him, and then Joshua is saying to him, remember what the Lord told Moses. The Lord your God will give you rest and hath given you this land. They didn't have to fight for that land. They just had to do what the Lord told them to do. Your wives, your little ones. And your cattle shall remain in the land which Moses gave you on this side, Jordan. But ye shall pass before your brethren armed, all the mighty men of valor, and help them. Until the Lord have given your brethren rest, as he hath given you, and they also have possessed the land which the Lord your God giveth you. Then ye shall return unto the land of your possession, and enjoy it, which Moses' the Lord's servant gave you on this side, Jordan toward the sun rising and they answered joshua saying i don't know that's too much for us to deal with you know we can't handle it joshua you know maybe maybe there's other people here he never said that <laughs> listen to what the people said 
And they answered Joshua in verse 16, saying, All that thou commandest us, we will do, and whithersoever thou sendest us, we will go. According as we hearken unto Moses in all things, so will we hearken unto thee. Only the Lord thy God be with thee as he was with Moses. Whosoever he be that doth rebel against thy commandment and will not hearken unto thy words and all that thou commandest him, he shall be put to death. Only be strong and of a good courage. The people had unity. The people had a leader in Joshua. They had a leader in Moses. But they also had to be in agreement. They, you know, all these different things that they were promised, they had to be united or it, it wouldn't work. It, was, it wasn't like... Um, I'm going to come on and I'm going to do one thing and um, I'm going to have four other people on the other side. They're going to be, none of them really agree with me, but they're going to be pulling in the other direction. And it's just like being yoked together with the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, when you're yoked together and the oxen are yoked together, they pull together and they go straight. They don't go off and do their own thing and wobble and all that other stuff. So that's kind of an interesting chapter right there. So he gives Joshua all this, these great promises, and the people will go with him. And they're in alignment and harmony with him. And now what I want to do is I want to go to uh, Second Chronicles, and we're going to go, we're going to start in Second Chronicles chapter 19, and we're going to um, get into this a little bit of the history of a fellow by the name of Jehoshaphat. And um, what I'm going to try to do is I'm going to try to, to um, excuse me, kind of point, put this together, showing uh, against all odds, fear versus faith, especially when it comes to battling. And in the Old Testament, many times the children of Israel were outnumbered. Um, Gideon's a good example of that. He wanted more, you know, the Lord kept telling him to take, get fewer and fewer men. And I think he ended up getting down to 300 against a multitude. How would you like to go into a battle against an enemy that was uh, like the, uh, the Iranian Republican Guard, 50 to 100, 125, 130,000. And the Lord says, well, I just want you to take 50 of your best men. And we're going to we're going to take care of them. Since knowledge wise, you're going, how? The Lord says, Well, I'm going to fight your fight for you. So we're going to see that as we go through Second Chronicles, and we're going to start in verse in chapter 19, and we're going to read through chapter 19, and we're going to get a little bit into uh, chapter 20. And it's it's really I want to show you some things that I think we can apply to our day and time. Maybe this, of course, this is different. This is the old testament, but the principles of unity are still the same. They haven't changed. I don't think that uh, when the word of God says we're supposed to be in the unity of the spirit and the bond of peace, I don't think that that's something that changes. It's um, where the spirit of the Lord is, there's liberty. You know, there's not tyranny, there's not anarchy, and there's not all this stuff that's going on around the country right now where people are protesting and burning, burning things down for, they say they're they're doing it for a cause and the cause of burning someone's business down. There's no cause in that. Okay, in verse, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, in Second Chronicles chapter 19, verse 1, Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, returned to his house in peace to Jerusalem. And Jehu, the son of Hananiah, the seer went out to meet him and said to King Joseph, shouldest thou help the ungodly? Listen to this for a second here. Should thou help the ungodly and love them that hate the Lord? Therefore is wrath upon thee from before the Lord. Okay, this is the seer saying this right away to Joseph. You know, the wrath of God's against you. What are you doing? Nevertheless, verse three, there are good things found in thee, in that thou hast taken away the groves out of the land, hast prepared thine heart to seek God. They worshipped idols. There was an incredible amount of idolatry in the land. And guess what? There still is. 
It may be different, but it's still idolatry. No matter what you make an idol in your life, whether it's uh, trying to, you know, whether it's the pursuit of money or, you know, fancy, fast cars or properties, things that make you look really good and so you can boast and brag about what you have, but these could be idols. And, and we're not supposed to have idols. We're supposed to be worshiping the one true living God. Okay. And in verse four, Jehoshaphat dwelt at Jerusalem and he went out again through the people from Beersheba to Mount Ephraim and brought them back unto the Lord God of their fathers. See, he was a leader, Jehoshaphat. He brought them back. Okay. This is so cool. And he said, judges in the land throughout all the fenced cities of Judah, city by city. He was, an, he was an active leader. And said to the judges, take heed what ye do. For ye judge not for man, but for the Lord, who is with you in the judgment. You look at these principles. Judges were supposed to be doing their judgments as they were in fellowship with the Lord. So if, if there was something brought against somebody, it was a fair outcome. You know, when you go into a court, you expect a judge to be fair. If you're not guilty, you should get exonerated for it. But that's the whole idea behind what he was doing here. As we go through this, it's really neat. In verse 7, wherefore now, let the fear of the Lord be upon you. Take heed and do it. For there is no iniquity with the Lord our God, nor respect of persons, nor taking of gifts. And I'm not really, I'm not 100% sure about that taking of gifts phrase. But I think the word, I think the word gifts is the word bribes, Greg. I'm pretty sure. And what is it, where, does it, where does that come in? Have we seen that through the history of the United States and then the government and people taking favors? I think they're called lobbyists now. You know? You know, you scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. You get in there and you pass these bills through and put some extra things um, in them. And, um, you know, you're going to get reelected time after time without any problems. Verse 8, moreover in Jerusalem did Jehoshaphat set of the Levites and of the priests and of the chief of the fathers of Israel for the judgment of the Lord and for controversies when they returned to Jerusalem. And he charged them, saying, Thus shall ye do in the fear of the Lord, faithfully and with a perfect heart. He, he was instructing them how to do this. And how was how did in the world judge all Joseph had? Joseph had, excuse me, that tongue twisted there. How did he know? The Lord was instructing him. He he was sensitive to know what to do. And as long as he did that, things were going to work out as we'll see as we go along here. And we go and we get to verse 10 here. And what cause soever shall come to you of your brethren that dwell in the cities between blood and blood, between law and commandment, statutes and judgments, ye shall even warn them that they trespass not against the Lord. And so wrath come upon you and upon your brethren, this do and ye shall not trespass. And behold, Amariah, the chief priest is over you in all matters of the Lord and Zebediah, the son of Ishmael, the ruler of the house of Judah for all the king's matters. Also, the Levite shall be officers before you deal courageously and the Lord shall be with the good. OK, and there we go. That's chapter 19. Now, he's setting he's setting a. Uh, a table, if you will, for what's going to happen in chapter 20. And this is a fantastic chapter, chapter 20, as we're going to get into it here. All of a sudden, things are going to get a little bit hairy, as they say. They're going to get a little bit, uh-oh, we're up against it. What are we going to do? And we're going to have to make a decision here. Are we going to seek the Lord, or are we going to try to do it ourselves? Are we going to be afraid, and they say fear is false evidence appearing real, or are we going to have faith that the Lord is going to be the one that's going to give us the answers and he's going to pull us through? And I'll show you as we go here. It came to pass 
in verse in chapter 20, verse 1, after this also that the children of Moab and the children of Ammon and with them other beside Ammonites came against Jehoshaphat to battle. Okay, all of a sudden, all these people are coming against him. Why? Then there came some that told Jehoshaphat, saying, There cometh the great multitude against thee from beyond the sea on this side Syria. And behold, they be in Hazon Tamar, which is in Gedi. And Jehoshaphat was scared to death, and he ran off and saw some psychic so that they could figure out what to do. Now, Jehoshaphat feared and set himself to seek the Lord. He set himself to seek the Lord, folks, and proclaimed a fast throughout all Judah. I believe it's September 26th in Washington, D.C. There's going to be a, a huge prayer gathering. Um, I, I know there is. I saw Franklin Graham on television recently. And uh, there's other, a lot of people are going to it, and it's going to be a prayer for the country. Um, I know that there are people out there that think that the United States is too late for prayer for the United States, but there's a lot of people out there that are still praying for the United States, and there's going to be a lot of people that are going to be getting together in Washington, D.C. on the 26th. So please pray for your brothers and sisters that are going to be up there. Uh, pray for Franklin Graham and the different leaders that are going to be up there and the members of the Senate and the House of Representatives that are going to um, go out to it and be part of it, you know, and of course for our president and vice president and their families. So, okay, in verse four, as I got off a little bit of it, I had, I had to mention that though. In verse four, and Judah gathered themselves together to ask help of the Lord, even out of all the cities of Judah, they came to seek the Lord. So this would be like, out of all the cities of the United States, they came to seek the Lord. Can you imagine that? That's, I believe we would call that a solemn assembly. And said, O Lord, <clears throat> excuse me. And Jehoshaphat stood in the congregation, verse 5, sorry about that. Got a little ahead of myself. He stood in the congregation of Judah and Jerusalem in the house of the Lord before the new court. And said, O Lord, God of our fathers, art thou not? Art not thou God in heaven, and rulest not thou over all the kingdoms of the heathen? And in thine hand is there not power and might, so that there none is able to withstand thee? <laughs> They're reminding God. Art thou not then our God, who drive, who didst drive people, drive out the inhabitants of this land before thy people, Israel, and gave it to the seed of Abram, thy friend forever? And they dwelt therein and have built the a sanctuary therein for thy name, saying, If when evil comes upon us as a sword, judgment, or pestilence, or famine, <clears throat> we stand before thy, this house in thy presence, for thy name is in this house, and cry unto thee in our affliction, and then thou wilt hear and help. And now behold the children of Ammon and Moab and Mount Seir, whom thou wouldest not let Israel invade as they passed through. They were not invade, did not invade them, they went around them. When they came out of the land of Egypt, but they turned from them and destroyed them not. Behold, I say, how they reward us to come to cast us out of thy possession, which thou hast given us to inherit. Verse 12, O our God, wilt thou not judge them? For we have no might against this great company that cometh against us. Neither know we what to do, but our eyes are upon thee. Okay. There's too many of them, Lord. The odds are against us. Against all odds. We, you know, we, we can't do it. There's no way that we have enough people to win a battle if we battle them. So what we're doing is we're seeking you. And we're, we're reminding you that you're the God. You're the one that's the prime mover. You're the ancient of days. You promised us this land, so you're going to have to take care of us. <laughs> and you know what? He does. I'm not trying to be facetious in any, any way, shape, or form. And look at this verse. In verse 13, I just love this verse so much. And all Judah, how about all America, stood before the Lord 
with their little ones, their wives, and their children. <laughs> Can you imagine a day in America where that would happen? Where you would have millions of people that would get up there and, yes, I'm standing for the one true and living God. And I don't really care what anybody thinks anymore because he's the true God. And I, I'm t tired of being politically correct with everybody. This is the way it's going to be. We're going to stand for him. Verse 14, then upon Jehaziel, the son of Zechariah, the son of Benaiah, the son of Jael, the son of Mataniah, a Levite of the sons of Asaph, came the spirit of the Lord in the midst of the congregation. Okay, they were seeking the Lord. Okay, Now they're going to get the word from the Lord. And he said, hearken ye all Judah and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem and thou King Jehoshaphat, thus saith the Lord unto you. It's interesting in this verse too, when you think about it, he doesn't say hearken ye Jehoshaphat because Jehoshaphat was the king. He says, hearken ye all Judah. He said, all you people that are here gathered seeking my will, I hear you. <sighs> if we can just get this into our hearts, folks, this is the word of God. This stuff is fantastic. And it's true. These stories are true. They're not fables that are just made up. Like, you know, guys sit down going, you know, Second Chronicles 20, let's talk about a battle. You know, this this be good to sell Bibles. No, these were records as holy men of God were moved by the Holy Spirit that they wrote. And these are written for our admonition. These things are written to, when we read them, to give us strength so that we can continue to go. You know, a lot of times life isn't easy. Things happen. And, you know, there's people that are, there's people that are suffering. There's people that are dealing with a lot of things right now that are difficult. But you know what? We have such a great treasure within us. You know, we if we're born again to the Spirit of God, we have God in Christ in us, the hope of glory. Uh, we have the uh, fellowship of the brethren, which is just an incredibly priceless thing that we can have. You know, we may differ in opinions on things. Shoot, I, you know. I don't know that much. I'm just a <laughs> just old California boy. But, you know, by the grace of God, he saved me. I'm thankful for it. Okay. He said uh, in verse 15, and he said, Hearken ye all Judah and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem and thou King Jehoshaphat. Thus saith the Lord unto you, Be not afraid nor dismayed by reason of this great multitude, for the battle is not yours but God's. Now, there's a promise for you, okay? You've got a multitude of people out there. These armies are huge. You, you know, you're looking at them, uh, like when I watched the movie Patton, when he's looking at it, you know, through his binoculars and looking at the enemy and everything, thinking to myself, okay, it's it looks pretty hopeless, but it looks like we can't win this one. But what we're going to do is we're going to listen. This is This is the prophet speaking to him. The battle is God's. It's not yours. Tomorrow, and these are the instructions, okay? Tomorrow in verse 16. Go ye out against them. Behold, they come up by the cliff of Ziz. Not Fizz, but Ziz. The Lord's telling he's, he's telling them where they're going to be. And ye shall find them in the end of the brook before the wilderness of Jabro. Ye shall not need to fight in this battle. Set yourselves and stand ye still and see the salvation of the Lord with you, O Judah and Jerusalem. Fear not, nor be dismayed. Tomorrow go out against them, for the Lord will be with you. He says, you set yourselves, be still. But I thought we were going to have to fight them, Lord. The Lord says, I'm going to fight it for you. You set yourselves, you be still. But the, the key to this whole thing is to do what the Lord tells you. And that's not easy a lot of times. You know, he might tell you to go somewhere and you're thinking, this is nuts. Why do I want to go there? But, you know, you realize after a while that maybe the Lord knows a little bit more than you do. Well, yeah, he knows a whole lot more than me, that's for sure. Okay, in verse 18, and Joseph bowed his head with his face to the ground. 
He was very humbled. And all Judah and the inhabitants of Jerusalem fell before the Lord, worshiping the Lord. They followed the king. See, the king was the king wasn't some elitist guy who had no um, dealings with the people. He was part of the people. He was the one that was the leader of the people. But he was he was a, a, a genuine person who cared about each and every individual, and that's why he sought the Lord because he knew if he hadn't done that, they would have been wiped out. There would have been no question about it. They would have been wiped out. But what he did saved his nation. And in verse nine and the, and verse nineteen, and the Levites and the children of the Kohathites and of the children of the Korhites stood up to praise the Lord God of Israel with a loud voice on high. Oh my goodness, where did this scripture come from? So we're not going to have our artillery and our air force there. We're going to praise the Lord. And, I, and we're going to get in this next section. This is so this is so exciting. In verse 20, and they rose early in the morning and went forth into the wilderness of Tekoa. And as they went forth, Jehoshaphat stood and said, Jehoshaphat's getting the revelation. now. Hear me, O Judah, and ye inhabitants of Jerusalem. Believe in the Lord your God. So shall ye be established. Believe his prophets. So shall ye prosper. And when he had consulted with the people, you see? He was a people guy. He consulted with the people. He didn't say, well, this is a, I'm going to do this edict, and I don't care what you think. He consulted with the people. He appointed singers unto the Lord. Singers unto the Lord. That they should praise the beauty of holiness as they went out before the army to say, praise the Lord for his mercy endureth forever. So they're out there. Praise the Lord for his mercy endureth forever. All these armies are, are getting ready to wipe them out. Praise the Lord for his mercy endures forever. And they're singing, probably as loud as they could sing. And these people are going, what in the world are these people doing? They're praising the Lord. They're singing. Oh, just, just, I hope we get re replays of these things when we get to eternity, because I'd love to see this one. And in verse 22, and when they began to sing and to praise, this key here, and when they began to sing and to praise, the Lord set ambushments against the children of Ammon, Moab, and Mount Seir, which were come against Judah, and they were smitten. For the children of Ammon and Moab stood up against the inhabitants of Mount Seir, utterly to slay and destroy them. And when they had made an end of the inhabitants of Seir, every one helped to destroy another. So in other words, they went against each other, not against Israel. And when Judah came forth toward the watch, tower of the wilderness they looked upon the multitude and behold there were dead bodies fallen to earth and none escaped and then it talks it goes through here as you get to the end here talking about um how long it took to pick up all the jewels and the spoils but the, they did not get rid of the high places toward the end they started mess they started to uh, in verse 31 now, let's go to let's let's go down to verse twenty nine here, and the fear of God was on all the kingdoms of these those countries because they heard what had just happened, right? When they had heard that the Lord fought against the enemies of Israel, so the realm of Josaphat was quiet, for his God gave him rest round about. After this, no one was messing with him. They realized that it was a losing battle for them to come against Israel. And Jehoshaphat reigned over Judah. He was 30 and five years old when he began to reign. He reigned 20 and five years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Azubah, the daughter of Shilhai. And he walked in the way of Asa, his father, and departed not from it, doing that which was right in the sight of the Lord. Howbeit, the high places were not taken away, for as yet the people had not prepared their hearts unto the God of their fathers. And, you know, it seems like the, the king's, they go along and they're doing really great and um, they're following the lead and they're doing things that that are going to gain them the victory. And then all of a sudden they uh, start to walk away from the Lord and things things start to fall apart after that. But the main uh, subject or main thought behind this me sharing this chapter was that uh, 
they sought <clears throat> the Lord, the whole nation, from the leadership on down. They realized that against all odds, they had to have, they had to take action. The action they took was to do the will of God by the instructions of the uh, prophets. You know, this is what they were told to do. And they, the, the whole nation sought the Lord and it wasn't hypocritical. It was to say, you know, we, we need you, Lord. And I think that we can pretty much relate to this. We're living in a different time, but prayer is an important thing. And uh, not just once in a while or one hour a week. I think it should be something that we should be doing instant in prayer. I think it was something we should be doing constantly. Um, Joseph had to me was a guy who I would have followed into battle with a sword. If he had said, you know, take your sword and we're going to go and, you know, we're outnumbered 450 to one, but um, we're going to, this is what the Lord wants us to do. I would have followed him into battle like good commanders. Uh, like George S. Patton, people followed him into battle because they knew he was a winner. And uh, different generals through the history of our country. Um, and it was not so that he could be this big famous guy and have everybody uh, telling him how great he was. Because his face was to the ground along with all the other people's faces that were to the ground. And they were worshiping God and they were um, putting him first and he saw the humility and then he delivered them. It's also, you know, like in, in the book of Job, I believe toward the end of the book of Job, it says, and the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. You know, his friends were miserable comforters, obviously, but he still loved his friends. He didn't stop loving his friends because of what they were saying about maybe he'd done this or that, but he prayed for him. He said, you know, Lord, I, I know that I haven't done these things, but you know, these other, these buddies of mine here, I, I, I love them still and I'm going to pray for them. And, and then the captivity turned. It was uh, Satan had tried so hard to get him to give up on, on, on the one true living God. He had tried to give up, have him give up on everything but he could, wouldn't do it. He stayed faithful. And that's one of the keys to walking uh, a victorious life is to be faithful. And uh, many times you hear it said on, on these programs and on others that you might watch that um, the key is faithfulness. The uh, Look at the word of God as being a offensive weapon because we're in a battle. It says we battle not. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against spiritual wickedness from on high. We are in a battle. We're wrestling. A wrestling match is hard. You know, those three minute rounds are tough. The weapon that we're using is the word of God. It's for the bringing down of strongholds. It's the more ammo, you, if you will, you have the sound words that are in God's word to take into the battle. And then the, the uh, battlefield is in the mind and the key the key to our lives is to be faithful and uh, i i don't know how it's going to be a year from now two months from now six months from now but what we can do is right now we can be faithful and in next 10 minutes you know we can each each minute of the of our lives we can endeavor to be faithful and be thankful and um I think Jehoshaphat was a good example of that. And um, I'm just thankful that we can have a fellowship and we can go on and we have the freedom in this wonderful country of the United States of America to share God's word without fear. I, I don't, you know, what, before I was born again, I had a lot of fear. And I heard about this man by the name of Jesus Christ who came to live his life and he laid down his life for me and he laid down his life for you and it cost God everything but he did it because of the joy that was set before him 
And it's the simplest thing in the world to just say, uh, Lord, you know, I want to, I want you in my life today. Um, not tomorrow. I want it today. And I want you to show me, help me, you know, show me how I can deal with things. And he'll put people in your path. that will teach you. He'll, he'll, he'll open up avenues that you've never imagined that could be opened. So anyway, I'm going to go ahead and uh, pray. Cause that's pretty much, uh, I, I don't know how to do a fancy wrap up or anything like that, but at the same time, I'm, I'm a uh, father. We thank you for the, the word of God that you've given to us. Uh, thank you for these examples of these men of old, these men of renown like Joseph had and, and Joshua and so many of the great leaders and uh, through history. And I thank you that uh, your word will go out and it won't come back void that we can look to you and realize that we can sing praises unto you. We can be just thankful people no matter what's going on. And I thank you for each and every individual that will be watching this and blessing their lives, their families' lives. If there's any sickness at all going on right now, that you will heal them. You will deliver them if they're any under any financial strain. Uh, any other things that might be going on. We just give these things to you and we thank you for this day in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.